let's go back then to Ephesians, the first chapter, and uh, we'll pick up our theme from verse 15 in chapter 1. So chapter 1, verse 15, down to verse 23. Do I have a reading, please? Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thank you very much. Now, Paul begins by expressing gratitude for their faith and and, and love. Faith in Jesus Christ and love for all the saints. I notice that he doesn't express credit for numbers but simply for spiritual qualities in his people. Now, should the message of God, is Christ and anybody else, <coughs> be <coughs> affected by the lack of, of spiritual experience of the believer? Well, let's go to the Zara Rachel and look at the experience of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Page 
and, and, and uh, desertion and those sort of things that are out there being any prospect or visible prospect of success in the future, as tough as not, much harder, much more difficult. What's that? You would know. I would know. I would know, certainly I would know. Now, all of us have an influence of good and evil, and I'd like someone to read this statement for quite a big lesson, please, if you will. It's a volunteer. Page 339. Two paragraphs on page 339. First of all, we go to Christ's influence and we go to each soul. Statement to me, I can hardly believe it's written there. What book was that? 
It's uh, speaks to the life of Paul. Page one four seven. And if that <coughs> this person was referring here to his eye trouble, I doubt it. That was not that was the disease really was it was it was an injury. A uh, loss of uh, capacity but not, not disease. So <coughs> when Paul suffered as he did and paid takes as he did on like his physical resources views of a church which has gone to apostasy such as the Galatians or the four of the Corinthians at the time would be very suppressive to his spirits. But when he came to Ephesus it was a different story altogether because he gave thanks to God for the love and faith of all the saints in that great city. So likewise we need to realise today that uh, we would bring over very different <coughs> contributions to God's court by being full of faith and love and thus bring thankfulness to God's people around about us. So verse 16, do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers. That, now we find this wonderful prayer that Paul prayed on behalf of the Ephesians and on behalf of all Christians everywhere, even now on behalf of today, so, so far removed from his time. Now I believe we should take this prayer of Paul as a promise of God to us. Let's know what he has to say. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Now, do you find it difficult to uh, penetrate the great gulf between yourself and Jesus Christ and obtain wonderful revelation to God's character and life? Yes. The commission does it. I often envy Moses who spent 40 days first and another 40 days later in the actual presence of God. And he was shown the glory of God and the character of God on the mountainside as well. How did others spend the next 40 days in God's actual presence, drawing him face to face? Wow, my marvel it's going to be. You couldn't help but come away from that kind of encounter or education being a lot better, a lot stronger in faith and so on, although Moses fell out as well to our surprise. But uh, why is it that we find communication with heaven so difficult? Because of sin. In the Garden of Eden, Adam held face to face communion with God in the person of Jesus Christ day after day in the Garden. When sin came, what then? That was broken. He did. He, 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 he did himself from God right. Now, we believe that when you pray, God hears our prayers. When God speaks to us on the other side, we don't know what you to say It seems to be easier one way than the other way. But uh, Paul prays in there that we might be endowed with the spirit of understanding to see for ourselves the the glory, the glory of God and the power of God and the character of God. In verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the Holy calling, what are the riches of glory of His inheritance and the saints. Now, we don't tend in this movement to look upon the material glories of the new world, do we? Streets of gold, gates of pearl. So on. We don't think about that very much at all. Because to us, what is by far the more important thing? Spiritual qualifications to be in the kingdom. And Paul likewise lists these things in this, in this prayer as well. That you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his appearance of the saints. Now, the hope of his calling. When you use the word hope, I hope it will be so. You tend to convey the idea that maybe it will, maybe it won't, don't you? Hope seems to be a possibility. But not so in the things of God because this hope of his calling is a certainty, right? It's a certain assurance, a certain hope, a certain prospect in the future. <coughs> now, does anyone need to be lost? No. Uh, what well, the majority will be. No one needs to be actually lost before the end of time when Christ comes again. And then we all should have a lively, positive hope of his calling 
to the kingdom and eternal security. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Now, what does the word glory mean? Yes, it means character. Uh, the character is inheritance. And the riches of it. Now, if you uh, are the beneficiary of a will, and you come into an inheritance left to you by your grandfather or your husband or your wife, or, your, or someone oh. else who's left this mm -hmm. to you, they've, they've had the experience for self. <laughs> Uh, you always look upon that as being the acquisition of wealth, don't you? Yeah. Or to improve your material status, it'll give you a higher level of financial power, and so forth. So, so inheritance always brings the idea of riches, unless, of course, your uh, your parents like to die and leave you debts to pay. Yeah. Thought of, another thought on the word glory there. I know in this movement we tend to take that quote where Sister White says, the glory dash character of God. Mm -hmm. uh, also, though, when she went into vision and she'd go, glory, glory, she wasn't saying character, character, you know, she was, she was talking about the magnificence of the exceeding beauty of being close to Jesus and seeing him. And I think that's probably the more accurate rendering of the word glory here. I think whenever we read glory, we don't necessarily have to read character, can we? the beautiful spiritual magnificence of also uh, seems yeah, to be a bit more in this class. That, that's well put. Uh, it would still be character, though, wouldn't it? Just the same. Because glory and magnificence character is. Yes. Yeah, because here um, <coughs> we know that the glory is veiled. In other words, the character is there, but its brightness doesn't shine. But in heaven and the, the eternal state, um, those spiritual things will actually shine out. Sure. Oh, yes, heaven is a place of light, and uh, Adam and Eve were dressed in a garment of light, which was the outshining of the glorious characters they had. So that uh, the, word, the word glory definitely has a larger meaning of brightness and outshining, which is about the as it's just been said. So that when we see the full glory of God, the full glory of the character of God, the full glory of the saints of God, there will be a physical outshining, which will be dazzling brightness and be very beautiful and wonderful. Of course, I haven't even lost that going on, but it's in the Right. Now, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the work of his mighty power, which he works in Christ and raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. And what is supposed Paul refers back to the resurrection as the best manifestation to our dull senses of the awesome power of God. That's the very power of creation. creation. Yeah, that's right. Being life where there was death. I think this question calls for a wide answer. It's, it's a very, very wonderful field of investigation, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, in order to bring Christ to the dead, what had to be overcome? What guard had been placed upon the tomb by Satan? Was he there himself? He certainly was. And would he virtually all the, <coughs> the evil host of angels and, and the Roman guard of the tomb as well? Now, while we don't exalt Satan's power, he is a powerful being, is he not? Right? In the minds of most people, who is the more powerful, Satan or God? In the minds of most people, Satan, Satan is right. There might be a flip side of the idea that God is the stronger, but in actual working practice, they believe that Satan is the stronger of the two, as evidenced by their acceptance of sin. Right, of sin. So when we find that around the tomb of Christ was assembled, they, they guarded the evil angels led by Satan himself. It didn't take power until his part of the break so it's caught and bring deliverance to his son. The one thing that Satan desired to achieve was the twist of the resurrection at any price he possibly could. And he could and could have all lost. Now, so in that assault upon the guard of evil angels around about that tomb, chaos of 
successfully is a guarantee that God certainly has the greater power and we've succeeded in the end in, in defeating Satan completely and assuring us of the place in heaven despite Satan having to keep us out. Now, in the odds, in other words, in one, one way further is the resurrection the revelation of God's power. Right, it shows he's the creator of life. It was God's capacity for the life of his death was shown once again in this miracle of the resurrection. And the capacity the capacity to end our life, of course, is the hallmark of the creator. And knowing that he can do that. And meant that, of course, are pursuing their hope to achieve a more totally by using uh, donor organs even the cake organs and so on that I've never succeeded in generally life as that's God's body of land. Now, thirdly, there's the confirmation of the creation and the sequence of events of the weekend. For instance, in the first creation, God made things in the first six days of the week. On the sixth day, he finished his work and, 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 and then first the seventh day. And the first day, again, the next phase of his work for mankind. Now, if the first creation was perfect, it certainly was, and the second creation must be a repetition of that perfection, must it not? <coughs> any change, any alteration would be an admission of God's part. The first was perfect and need to be improved. So one day, one day that Christ finished his ministry, say he was finished, the sixth day of the week, and the rest of the grave on thee, the seventh day of the on thee, First of all, thus confirming God's uh, perfection of creation in the beginning. Now, I know, of course, there's somebody today who teaches that Christ was crucified on Wednesday and Rosary on Friday, but that is so changing as to deny the God, God's creative power in the first case. So then, Paul talks about uh, the exceeding grace of his power to those who believe. When working his mighty power. It becomes very obvious that Paul knew by personal experience the awesome power of the living God, right? He knew by personal experience. And uh, tried to find words that were expressive enough to convey to his hearers the same picture he had in his own mind. Now, words have meaning according to our experience. When you use the word, you have the word pain. If you live the healthy life where I've never had a headache, never had any serious pain, does that really mean the same thing as a person who does have serious pain all their life? And it doesn't, right? And then when you're trying to complain what you know, you're limited by the concepts of the person's mind of the words that you use. So the poor has a struggle to find words to complain to his hearers, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, Paul knew, of course, that he could give them the same glimpse of that which he himself had. They would rise in their experience to greater heights than before. And that's why he strove to bring that picture to them. In fact, Paul realized, as he wrote to the Ephesians, that they needed desperately to see God as God in all his power, in all his character, all his glory, all his might, that might continue to successfully withstand the temptations of that great city. <coughs> Now, verse 20, 20 verse 5 through there. Now, now a fourth uh, evidence that God's exceeding great power was manifested in the creation was the elevation of Jesus Christ into what place? Heavenly places. Now, this is quite a miracle because Jesus Christ was still a man who went back to heaven and still is a man who was very in fact, be a man forever. And to take a man, in this case Jesus Christ, and place him side by side of God in his throne, that is surely a manifestation of Almighty power. Let's go back to Hebrews, the first, go on to Hebrews, the first chapter for a moment to uh, make that point. And of course, Christ's achievement of that elevation is ensured to our achievement of the same elevation because we have joint heirs with Christ. And shall live and reign with him forever. Hebrews chapter 1. So read the first three verses, please. God, who at various times and various ways 
spoke of turning back to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things in the word of his power, he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. Thank you very much. And Paul right into the Hebrews, to the Jews, of course, and these are the very folk who seen Christ walking up and down amongst them for three and a half years. And what have they seen? A God or a man? A man. A man, right? A man. And now here's Paul telling those men, Paul and Hebrews telling those men, that Jesus Christ, that man whom they saw, dusty and warm and travel, just an ordinary man like themselves, having lifted up to a certain right with God in his throne to sit there on his right hand. Now, what a stupendous transition it was from this earth up to heaven. Really, tremendous transition. And certainly an evidence of God's almighty power to achieve that kind of <coughs> elevation of, of a man clad in fallen, simple, mortal human nature. And of course, in that elevation would come likewise the assurance of our elevation in the same position to sit with Christ in stone as well. I appreciate this point throughout the whole of this first chapter of Hebrews because Paul goes on to draw a contrast between the angels as messengers and created beings and the Son and of Jesus Christ. So read verse 5, please. Chapter 1, verse 5. From verse 4 and 5. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent being than they, for unto which of the angels said to him any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Then Paul asks the question in verse 5, and again in verse 6, he asks two questions in verse 5, right? And the first question was, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, and today I have forgotten you? What's the answer? To none of them. So therefore, angels are not begotten beings, they are created beings. And as such, of course, are much lower in the scale of uh, God's system than, uh, than is the begotten being. Now, to whom did God say, you are my son, that today I have forgotten you? Right, to my the archangel, which of course is Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 6, I'm going to read verse 6, please. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. And who worships who? The angels the angels Jesus worship Christ. Christ. Angels worship Jesus Christ. And in all the universe, who alone receives worship? God. God. And Christ and the Holy Spirit were short for God here. Angels can't have been, so they must not. So this then shows that uh, Christ is God in the surest sense of that word, and therefore was qualified as with, with God in his throne. Let's read the rest of the chapter then quickly, please. Somebody, verse 8, 2, 13, 14. Under the Son, he said, Thy throne of God is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness among thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou hold them, hold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, and I make thy enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Thank you. The very obviously, of course, the begotten Son has a far richer inheritance than the created sons. Far richer. And that's evidence, of course, by Jesus Christ is also at the right hand of God. Now, what are we begotten sons or created sons? Begotten We're begotten, right? We're born into the family of God. We are begotten sons and daughters. 
ever much credit in, in the garden of Eden for the gift of God's son of life, of course. So then we then have to go back to Ephesians, the first chapter now. We have these several uh, points as to why and how it was the resurrection was the wonderful expression of revelation of the mighty power of God, the exceeding greatness of God's power to all those who believe. Now, all that mighty power which broke through Satan's cordon, which was the life of his death, which confirmed the creation, and which elevated Jesus Christ to the highest heavenly places, all that power is towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power. <coughs> now, if that power is towards us who believe, what purpose is that power towards us who believe? For our salvation, victory over sin, victory over sickness, victory over the forfeit, victory over death in the end, when final victory is changed. <coughs> so when we begin to realize the greatness of that power, to see it for ourselves, to appreciate the magnitude of might and effectiveness, and appropriate it to ourselves, we certainly shall advance in our Christian experience with mighty leaps and bounds. So what we, we, we must then pray to get a rid of Paul that our understanding shall be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of our calling and what are the riches of God's inheritance and the saints. Let's just learn to pray that prayer to become effective in our experience as it was in the experience of Paul himself. In verse 22 and 23, uh, verse 21, 22, and 23, yeah. Ephesians just chapter 1, so I'm ready for this. For above all, for above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, and fullness of him, which goes all and all. Good. Now, Father, all principalities, and powers, might, and dominion. What are principalities, powers, might, and dominions? Kingdoms? Spiritual? Yeah, well, and physical. And physical as well. Both in this age and in that which is to come. There will there be in heaven principalities or the new, the new earth situation in the, in the, in the coming period of peace and prosperity, will there be principalities, powers, mights, and dominions? Principality, power, and might, and dominion of God. Yeah. It says that those who are faithful over one city will be content. We're also told that will be kings as well as priests. Sure. Now, the point is this. Uh, at the present moment, there are planets inhabited by creatures out there throughout the entire universe. Billions of them. And on each of those planets, there's, there's a kingdom. Principalities and powers, mights and millions. It is an item. Right? But Jesus Christ is head of every one of them. And not just to, but today, and of course, in the time which is to come. We can't say he's head over some of these, these uh, corrupt human dominions and power because that's too much to expect. The coming kingdom, he'll be head over all those principalities and powers, and we shall reign with him in his headship of all those kingdoms when they come. So that um, the exaltation of Christ is an incredible picture of uh, God's power to elevate a mortal person within sinful human nature to the highest position in the entire universe. Well, I'll pause at that point. Any questions you'd like to ask or thoughts you'd like to add? Do we have Do we have any evidence that there would be more creative beings after redemption occurs? No, no, I think on the contrary that uh, that was the end of God's creative work. Mm. I think that was not true. Yeah. Yeah.
before communicated with humanity through Christ, but now he communicated with humanity in Christ. Satan had hoped that God's abhorrence of evil would bring an eternal separation between heaven and earth. But now, with his master, the connection between God and man can be restored. And in our baptism, we are into Christ, and we have that privilege to go direct to God to speak to him. Through Christ. Through Christ. Sure. In Christ. Not through, in. Yes, there is some difference, sure. So it has been through, now it is in. Again, it has made an impact. We can go direct to God's speaking and in Christ. Where's that going? Good. Yes, uh, Richard. Uh, just a thought from the last, I guess it's the end of the last study when we were talking about the inheritance. And my thought was that an inheritance comes through death. Um, death of the person who owns the, the goods. And not only is it spoken up of the saints as having an inheritance, namely God, but um, in Deuteronomy 32.9, uh, it's also stated that God himself has an inheritance. It says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So I can see it kind of goes both ways, just as through, um, through the death of Christ, we receive the inheritance. Likewise, through our death, God receives the inheritance of us. And as Paul says, that when Christ died, we were all dead, and now that we live unto him, our lives are not our own, and they're to be lived you know, to him, because he has inherited that point. Good point, yeah. Our comments on earth. We were saying that Moses spent 40 days in the actual presence of God. And I was thinking by faith, you should be up in the most holy place in the actual presence once again. Sure. And as long as we remain there, we cannot sin. It's when we separate from that, okay, when we lose our faith, that we enter sin. But now the question came to me as I was thinking that, Desire of Ages 528. And I don't have the answer to this, but it's a question. So this is when Christ was on earth. Had Christ been in the sick room, Lazarus would not have died. For Satan could have no power over him. Death could not have aimed to start at last in the presence of the light giver. Therefore Christ remained away. He suffered the enemy to exercise his power. So what does that mean to us if we are in the presence of, of the life giver?